Unions of the largest non-profit healthcare company in the United States have launched a historic strike on Wednesday. What is the context and what are the consequences uh, for healthcare in the world's largest economy if workers' demands continue to not be taken seriously? In Thailand, the opposition Move Forward Party has tabled a draft bill that seeks amnesty from prosecution for political protesters going back to the year 2006. What are the key aspects of the bill, of course, and what are its prospects for being passed by parliament? And finally, France ended a decade of absenteeism from the UN sittings on decolonization in regards to French Polynesia. But the government's stance does not seem to have changed. We will find out exactly why. Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you from a different setting again, uh, all over the world this time. Uh, as a consequence, of course, of the Delhi police's uh, little bit of a brutal crackdown on press freedom and the sealing of the studio from which we uh, normally operate. Uh, we, of course, issued this disclaimer yesterday as well, but please do forgive us for any glitches in our internet connections or inadvertent uh, errors we might make, including a couple of uh, goof-ups that I did yesterday. Uh, but this is also an invitation for you to support the work that our reporters uh, and others at People's Dispatch do. You can head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Right, first up, the coalition of Kaiser Permanente Unions, which represents close to 85,000 employees of the company, which, like I was saying earlier, is the largest non-profit in the healthcare sector in the United States. Uh, they launched on Wednesday a historic strike action, one of the largest of its kind in history, uh, taking place across five United, uh, United States, well, five states in the United States, as well as Washington, D.C. Demands, of course, include bringing wages in line with currently uh, current rates of inflation, um, better pay at entry-level positions, staffing levels, and other issues that have an impact not just on the quality of life of workers, uh, but also how effective the care that they are able to provide is. Uh, it includes, therefore, safety of workers, safety of patients, uh, and, of course, the quality of care. Uh, given trends in the United States, some estimates indicate that the healthcare sector could be short-staffed by as many as a million people by 2030. You can, of course, gauge the kind of impact that would have uh, if, of course, the current approach by management at these big companies towards workers' rights and their demands continue uh, to not be taken, negotiations not being held in good faith. Anna Brachar of the People's Health Movement is a regular on Daily Debrief and uh, she's with us today as well to talk more about this historic strike. Um, Anna, good to see you. Good to see you. Very happy to be For, here. Uh, first off, Anna, can, can you tell us what the situation is on the ground? Wednesday, the strike was launched. Uh, it's a continuation, of course, of, uh, of several uh, processes underway in the United States and elsewhere in the world. So give us some context before we go any further. Right. So uh, essentially what what we're seeing in the U.S. now is, of course, what you have said, one of the biggest healthcare strikes that uh, that the U.S. has seen. Uh, it's important because it's taking place uh, in uh, in many of the states in over 39, uh, 39 hospitals that Kaiser owns there. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the number of workers who are taking place in the strike is enormous. Uh, so uh, essentially what... Uh, what stands behind the strike is, uh, as many other workers in many other contexts uh, have quoted, is that management is not respecting uh, their demands, it's not respecting their needs, and is essentially uh, looking away from uh, from the patient's interest, from the worker's interest, and instead is uh, is looking to bump up profits. So uh, this this strike that we're seeing at Kaiser today uh, is not only a demonstration for workers' rights; it's also a demonstration for quality care and uh, for patient safety. And just you know, to make a point of this, this uh, has particular importance in the case of Ka Kaiser because uh, it usually mm. uh, it, it usually talks about itself uh, as a company which puts patients first, patients before profits, patients before the bottom line. Uh, and essentially what we have seen in practice is that uh, while uh, uh, health workers working at Kaiser have seen their bonuses cut down, uh, manager, managers have not. So what 
essentially what's been happening is that uh, the executive level still uh, st uh, still manages to to earn uh, enormous amounts of money while the working uh, while the health workers the the frontline uh, staff uh, is having difficulties making ends meet mm. and essentially because of that uh, what uh, the unions have been demanding is at least a 25 uh, US dollars uh, hourly wage. Uh, this is something that's on the table right now, uh, has been avoided by the management uh, in the lead up to the strike. Uh, but what's mm. interesting here is to note that, you know, some uh, some of the testimonies that we've seen on social media uh, and Kaiser recruitment uh, essentially reaching out to health workers, offering them uh, 70 US dollars or more to work in the period while the strike is going on. So essentially it's not about Kaiser not having the money to pay the, mm. pay the workers, but it's essentially about uh, them not making them a priority. So uh, what the workers again are demanding is of course better wages, but they're also asking for better staffing. Uh, and that's, I think, very important to, in, if we look at the broader context of uh, the health work, workers shortages in the world. Uh, mm. Because it's healthcare shortages that cause the, um, the tremendous amount of uh, overtime that workers are struggling with, and the enormous stress that ha they have been uh, they have been uh, forced to, to handle dur during the yeah. COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, so this is all you know uh, a picture of what we've been seeing uh, in the world uh, in the past years and months. Yeah, uh, I, I know. Uh, at this point, uh, I believe negotiations are not on. And of course, unions have issued a statement saying that uh, there is some sort of agreement on some issues, uh, but nothing official yet. Uh, how are things likely to proceed uh, a little bit on that? What what to expect over the next uh, few days? Uh, and then we can talk about uh, maybe a little more detail on some of the sort of wider, longer term impact of uh, the situation. Uh, yeah, so again, you're right. Uh, it's a bit difficult to predict what's going to happen. Um, so what what has been reported by the by the striking health workers on social media is that mm -hmm. now that the strike is on, the conversations have opened up a bit. So there has been a complete block until now, and now it's it's getting a bit better. Uh, there are some things which uh, executive and management are now uh, are now talking about. This includes the 25 US dollars hourly wage. Uh, but still, it's um, it's difficult to predict how how seriously this will be taken in the longer term. If we judge from other examples, uh, what managements have have tried to do is essentially make this a one case issue. Uh, you resolve the issue, you overlook it, and then you just mm. move on. You don't actually try to go uh, and resolve the root causes of of the problem. So that's I think something that uh, we should be we should be looking at. And it's especially interesting in the case of the U.S. because, you know, um, a, a couple of months ago, OK, not a couple of months ago, almost a year ago, uh, we saw mass strikes by nurses in New York City. Uh, so this is something that's obviously going to keep up in, in the health sector in the United States. Mm. So is this sort of um, lack of uh, getting to the root cause of the issues uh, simply because there's an attitude in management that, uh, you know, uh, the impact will be felt by those who are, uh, again, in the same sort of in, in the working class and the same people, many of whom uh, perhaps might be working at some of these companies as well. And, and so that the rich will always be able to afford the kind of healthcare they need. So, so for the rest, let, let them keep uh, struggling. Well, yes, I think that uh, there's something to that, uh, although it has to be said that the health worker shortage now has become is becoming uh, a very big, big and hot topic uh, worldwide. So, you know, uh, we've seen countries, especially in the global north, spending years and years ignoring that there was a problem uh, in the global south, but also in the global north. Uh, and this is now mm. hitting home. So, you know, um, uh, there are some estimates uh, they differ, I have to say. So estimates differ in how many health workers will be missing in the United States alone in the next mm. uh, five, five or so years. Uh, but mm. some of them actually put the uh, estimated uh, nursing shortage at one million by the end of the year. So one mm. million nurses only in the United States uh, by mm. the end of this year. So, uh, you know, it's a bit difficult to ignore <laughs> what this will mean for, yeah. for the health system. 
Uh, and again, I think it's important to take into consideration that what the situation in the health work workforce that we're seeing now is even worse compared to pre-COVID-19 uh, levels. Because uh, again, in the United States, uh, there are now 1% fewer workers uh, working in the health sec sector compared to uh, compared to pre-2020. And you know, mm -hmm. this is this is a sign of how deeply the pandemic has actually affected the sector. Uh, but it's also a symptom of how the government has reacted to the pandemic of uh, yeah. the approach that it has taken. And then there's one final thing that I think it has to be said in the context of the US is that not everyone will be affected the same. And this is something that you already mentioned. So, you know, the rich, of course, will be less affected than the poor. Uh, and cities will be much less affected than rural areas. Rural. So mm. uh, already at the beginning of the year, uh, some analysis have been published that uh, that warned that around 600 rural hospitals in the US that's around 30%, one third of all the rural hospitals in the state, uh, in the country, uh, could be closed because of health, uh, health worker shortages and uh, because of lack of funding. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, that's something that's uh, that's going to add to the uh, already existing burden of health deserts that we're seeing mm -hmm. in the United States, particularly yeah. when it comes to specific aspects of care, like sexual yeah. and reproductive health rights, but also primary care. So uh, the strike is also relevant because of that. It points at how deeply, uh, how deeply the, the health workers shortage uh, has to be uh, has to be addressed. Addressed. Yeah. Thanks very much for for that sort of uh, primer once again, uh, Anna, on everything that's going on in this uh, vital vital sector and government as well as management at some of these private companies' lack of uh, willingness to really address those issues and take it seriously and, and just paint it out to be, uh, again, workers demanding more money. Uh, thanks very much for your time today. Thanks. Right, our next story, we're talking about Thailand, where the leading opposition party, the Move Forward Party, which of course won the elections in May this year, but was unable uh, to form a government. Uh, the party has now filed a draft bill in parliament seeking amnesty for those who have been charged with crimes while engaged in democratic protests. These include political rallies and other kinds of demonstrations. Uh, and the bill looks to cover all of those who have uh, been uh, charged with crimes for being engaged in these kind of agitations over a nearly two-decade period, going back to 2006. Thailand has, of course, been uh, the site of intermittent but consistent political volatility. There have been two coups, multiple prime ministers have been uh, removed. There have been protests on the streets, uh, some of which have, have, of course, turned violent. There has been repression of protesters uh, as well. And many, many have been charged under, under the country's uh, very harsh, very strict uh, lays majesty laws. And be of particular interest to see how the establishment approaches that aspect of the bill and how it considers protesters who are charged with lays majesty uh, crimes uh, Anish covers the region for People's Dispatch and is with us on the show, as he often is. Uh, Anish, good to have you back today. Uh, first up, Anish, I guess one of the most important considerations, probably how does Move Forward propose uh, that Parliament decide on who is eligible for amnesty and who is not? Well, the draft bill basically uh, considers a very uh, sweeping amnesty for uh, political agitators and protesters uh, since 2006. And the date of 2006 is quite uh, significant, basically saying before or after uh, February 11, 2006, and until uh, the time when the, uh, the parliament uh, passes the bills. And uh, there was a massive, uh, you know, legal uh, repression at the time, and that actually created some people who were charged with multiple uh, charges of, uh, you know, disrupting public uh, uh, order and other kinds of charges as well. Uh, some were even charged with seditions at the time. Uh, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, the agitation led to a coup, uh, and uh, so the yellow shirts are pretty much the more conservative. Uh, you know, pro-military uh, groups uh, who actually support, uh, who were against the more populist uh, Thaksin Shinawatra government at the time. Uh, later, we had multiple demonstrations of the same kind, and this includes the other group, which is the UDD or the United Front for uh, Democracy and Against Dictatorship, uh, which who are called the Red Shirts. And the Red Shirts were the ones who came about in, uh, uh, you know, 2007, if I'm not wrong, yeah, 2000. Eight, uh, 2010, sorry, I'm so sorry. 
2010 when uh, uh, you know Thakshin Shinawatra actually uh, uh, another Shinawatra controlled uh, government uh, actually faced a similar kind of yellow shirt demonstration and they went against that and this was primarily uh, in response to the military coup that also happened at the time. So all of these factors definitely uh, the people who were uh, you know victims of you know violent repression at the time uh, people yeah. who support different kinds of political formations and more most of them most of whom are uh, you know part of the establishment and the ruling coalition right now uh, are uh, said to be uh, considered along with the less majeste protesters and you know the pro democracy and monarchy reform uh, agitators that we saw very recently and we covered on our show as well uh, mm. and so you know clubbing them all together but uh excluding the ones who were in government so including bureaucrats uh, law enforcement officials who were uh you know responsible for violent crackdowns uh or you know any kind of uh, action that actually threatened life uh, of the agitators and the protesters would not be considered so it is pretty much uh, you know giving amnesty to political protesters and the manner in which it is uh, you know drafted is primarily to gain support from obviously the ruling coalition uh, which includes the conservative uh, groups who were supported by the uh, the yellow shirts at one point and uh, the uh, and obviously Fuetai, who is leading the government right now which who were supported primarily uh, by the red shirts uh, during various agitations. So in both of these cases, uh, it is very. It will be very interesting to see if the government would go through with the bill and support the bill, because obviously Fuetai recently went through a sort of, uh, you know, a crack on its credibility after aligning with pro-military and conservative groups to form a government. And obviously mm. it might try to gain back some of that credibility uh by uh it is an opportunity obviously whether or not it is going to considered as a different thing but it is definitely an opportunity for it to gain back some of that credibility among people who have been uh you know advocating for democracy for human rights for uh, various other issues who had supported uh with i uh in the, during the elections and even campaigned for them so it mm. will be quite interesting to see how this thing pans out yeah, but Anish, I was asking uh, procedurally also, uh, how, how do things move forward? Can we expect uh, this bill to be either passed or not passed uh, in, in, you know, in the next couple, few weeks, for example? Or is it likely to be a long process that involves uh, multiple rounds of discussion? Uh, how, how is it going to work? And, and what also uh, seemed to be the initial, the starting point? Well, uh, it is quite difficult to say because... Uh, you know, when you're talking about a parliamentary democracy, uh, you know, processes can be quite long. Uh, in this case, uh, since the parliament is not in active session right now, it will be very difficult to say if there can be any movement on the bill in the coming weeks. Uh, so it might be a long broad process and there will obviously be debate because apart from the House of Representatives, which is pretty much, uh, you know, consisting of elected representatives, uh, entirely, uh, you have the Senate, which is uh, basically military appointees. Most of, mm. uh, pretty much all of them are military appointees. Uh, many of them are obviously set to go through election in you know coming years, but uh, at, at, uh, right now, as, as of now, yeah, as of now, they're basically military appointees who were appointed under the the coup government, the NCPO government at the time, uh, and uh, they are. They are probably going to be a big roadblock, uh, and even you know it might be very difficult for them to make them you know uh, be on board with the bill because obviously some several of them were the ones who uh, you know the Senate pretty much led the way to blocking uh, you know move forward parties uh, uh, you know the for government. the prime minister exactly prime ministership yeah. position and you know the form of government primarily because it advocated for reform in the lesser majesty bill. Reform, you're not even talking about abolition. It's just yeah. basic reforms. Uh, and even that was not something that uh, the Senate would consider. So considering that uh, this bill is going to uh, demand for, uh, you know, amnesty for uh, lesser majesty protesters as well, and people who advocated for reforms in monarchy, reforms in government, uh, many of whom are, uh, you know, charged with sedition, which will also be included in the bill uh, will be considered uh, for the amnesty. Uh, the Senate is definitely going to be a major roadblock in that. 
And before that, even in the House of Representatives, we have already have conservative talk and the pro-military talk not being very keen on giving any kind of amnesty to these sections of protesters, even though they mm. might be open to you know allowing for you know red shirts and yellow shirts being given right. amnesty. So it is a different thing. We need to see how things move forward and what kind of uh, you know uh, alliances and coalition the mm. move forward might go for in uh, for to get this uh, bill passed. But definitely, oh. it's a significant step towards addressing a certain part of civil liberties that have been. Uh, you know, that have went unaddressed for very long in high politics. All right, Anish, we'll leave it there for, for this story. But of course, we we'll also want to talk to you about uh, French Polynesia. Uh, I'll be back with you in a second. Uh, it's our final story on the show today. Uh, France, which has been in the news over the past weeks and months and on this show as well, about its uh, colonial past and in some ways uh, present in Africa, uh, is now in uh, uh, back on the show in the context of French Polynesia. Uh, France has ended its nearly decade-long absence by turning up to the French, French Polynesia sittings uh, of the UN Special Committee on Decolonization. Uh, France's ambassador to the UN attended uh, the sitting, but the message delivered by him uh, was probably not the one that France, uh, that French Polynesia, sorry, French Polynesia's new president and pro-independence leader, Muay Brotherson, and his compatriots would have wanted to hear. Uh, French Polynesia was put back on the list of non-self-governing territories by the UN in 2013. But the French ambassador and therefore the French government said that the 100 plus islands that make up the collectivity have no place belonging to the list of non-autonomous uh, countries and territories. Uh, Anish hopefully is still with us if the internet gods are permitting. Uh, Anish? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I, Anish, so, so uh, you know, we... we We've heard uh, we've heard sort of some sort of uh, assurances from uh, Emmanuel Macron's government uh, that the pro-independence uh, desires of the people of French Polynesia will be taken more seriously. How does this fit in uh, with what happened at the meeting of the Special Committee on Decolonization? Uh, well, I think before that, we need to give like a quick, uh, uh, small little context uh, about why France uh, suddenly decided to. Uh, sit for uh, these UN decolonization sittings on French Polynesia, and that primarily has to do with the fact that the recently elected uh, uh, new uh, the new government of uh, French Polynesia under Mutai Brotherson uh, basically acquired a promise from the French government at the time in kind of uh, you know a parley for uh, various uh, concessions uh, uh, that they will be attending these sessions uh, from now on. And this is this being the first one since the government was formed in May uh, this year. Uh, they actually attended, uh, but they just uh, you know continued their stand, uh, their official stand that has been there for a very long time uh, on their islands and their uh, and their uh, claim over those islands, and uh, and even you know uh, repeated the same kind of uh, strategy, which is to walk out. Uh, whenever French Polynesia is discussed, and they pretty much gave the statement and uh, you know walked out of the uh, the session as well. So this pretty much uh, doesn't change much uh, at this current scenario. Uh, the status quo exists, uh, but definitely this is a, not a good time for France, uh, considering that it is also facing sort of setbacks. Uh, in its colonies, other colonies, we saw a new. We have talked about New Caledonia recently. They've lost uh, in September last month. Actually, they lost uh, a Senate seat. Uh, the senator being a minister in the macro government, uh, she lost the seat uh, to a pro-independence uh, candidate, and that clearly shows that there is a certain tendency within these uh, two Pacific Island colonies uh, to actually assert their uh, their their demand for independence. Or at least, at the very least, their demand for a more autonomous uh, constitution. All right, uh, Anish. Apart from uh, discussions that might be happening at various uh, sort of UN uh, forums, uh, what is the kind of bilateral relationship between the two governments, and uh, do, do we see sort of uh, this as something that can be resolved without? Uh, the intervention of let's or the participation of any kind of multilateral organization. 
Uh, it is very difficult to say because at, at, under the current government, obviously, there is no chance of any resolution or any consideration of, uh, you know, their right to self-determination uh, without foreign interference. We have to remember that even in the past, whatever referendums have happened, uh, be it in Caledonia or in other parts of uh, other French colonies that they call departments or overseas collectivities, departments, which is whatever it be. Uh, mm. these, uh, these have happened only because uh, there were considerable international pressures uh, and especially interventions on multiple levels by the United Nations and obviously the non-aligned movement who also supports uh, the current French politician. Uh, 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 the independence movement uh, and even the concentration of them being in the list of uh, you know non self governing territories in the un list so this uh, we have to see how the pressures are going to be but uh, consider the fact that this is probably the first time that a very pro a very outrightly pro independence uh, government is in power in french polynesia things are going to be uh, uh, going to be quite interesting to say the least uh, in the coming years for uh, in the Pacific, especially for uh, France's multiple collectivities and departments and regions and territories yeah. uh, in the region as well. All right. All right. Thanks very much, Anish. And I think that's pretty much all we have time for on this episode of Daily Debrief from Anish, uh, myself, and the entire team, uh, or at least those of us who are still able to do some work. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll be back hopefully tomorrow, same time, same place, with another episode of Daily Debrief. Until then, I'll take this final opportunity to ask you once again, of course, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, but also head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, uh, where you can get a sense or, or get details on all of the work we do. Uh, stay safe until tomorrow. Thanks for watching again. Goodbye.